All right. Well, on today's episode, we are continuing on in our sermon series um, covering 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14. And right now we're in the middle of chapter 13. We've been in chapter 13 now for a couple of weeks. Um, last week we started to uh, delve into what Paul describes as far as what love is. And in this episode, uh, the sermon that, I, that I'm going to share with you is a continuation of that. Last time we looked at verses 4 and 5, and in this one we explore verses 6 and 7. So we're still in the middle of chapter 13, and then next time we'll, we'll finish up chapter 13 with the rest of the verses in that chapter. So hope that you've been enjoying uh, these messages and hope that it's been encouraging to you. So um, I'm not going to waste a lot of time here and, and going to try and get you right into the sermon. Uh, but before doing that, again, as usual, if you, will, if you enjoy this program, and you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on Apple Podcasts, also on iHeartRadio, YouTube, or Spotify. You can also follow me, Steve Gill, on X. The handle is at LTScripts, that's L-T-S-E-R-I-P-T-S, which stands for Loving in Scriptures, and also my other account, at LTScriptsPod, that's L-T-S-E-R-I-P-T-S, P-O-D. And you can also, um, I would also encourage you to order a copy of my book, Signs of the End, what did Jesus say about his own return and the and the events that point to it? It's a book about the Olivet Discourse, Mark 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21. I think it would be a very helpful and instructive read uh, just as it relates to uh, giving us a, a what I believe to be a proper biblical perspective on the end times. And not only just on the end times, by the way, but how we look at things presently today. Um, even before Christ comes and things leading up to uh, the the return of Jesus Christ. So um, uh, Amazon.com, BarnesNoble.com are the two main places where you can order a copy of that book. I hope you do so, and I hope that you're blessed by it. Okay, I don't think I'm forgetting anything. So without any further ado, I'm going to transition you into the sermon. I hope you enjoy it. My name is Steve Gill, and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. Bible. Let's go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the second Sunday of the month. So we're continuing our study of uh, chapters 12, 13, and 14 in there. Um, you may have noticed that, uh, that Mark isn't, uh, isn't here. He's uh, not feeling well. Um, so, you know, it, it would, we would prefer that he not be sick at all, but if he was sick, I mentioned earlier, I guess it's a good thing that it's on the second Sunday where he doesn't have to preach, so, um, so, uh, but uh, keep him in your prayers that uh, have a, a full recovery. Um, this has been, I'm going to, I'm going to just lay out here that um, this, you know, obviously I have a, you know, between, between months when I, when I preach, you know, I have like a whole month to look through the text uh, study it and that sort of thing, um, which I've done, you know, nothing different this time around. But I, I would have to say that this week, the week leading up to today, um, has really, um, um, I don't know what the right word to use, it's just kind of maybe awakened in me just kind of the import of what we're looking at and what we're studying. Um, you know, just discussions that I've had um, you know, regarding people who are, uh, you know, where situations are really bad, you know, it, it brings to mind just the whole thing of how important love is within all our relationships, within the body of Christ, within marriage and that sort of thing. Um, and it may, and it just kind of stirred something up in me um, where, and, and, I, and I prayed to God and I prayed this week, I prayed driving, driving here and, you know, even saying a little short prayer before even coming up here that what we look at here, I, I, I hope, I hope that we don't look at these as just mere words. Okay. I hope that we, that we grasp the import of this and that we don't find ourselves in a continual pattern of 
always living for self. And listen, I'm, I'm, ta I'm talking to me just as much as, as all of you because we all need this message. Um, but just this past week, just really just being awakened to, to the fact of what, you know, uh, a life outside of love really looks like. And it's ugly. It really is ugly. And so we look at, you know, where we are now in 1 Corinthians 13 about love. And again, we've mentioned, you know, you know I think we're all aware that it's a very well-known chapter. You know, it's dubbed the love chapter. And I think a lot of people love, love the love chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. I mean, it, I mean just as far as, as far as the way that it's written and the way it flows, it sounds beautiful. The words are beautiful. Um, I would just encourage us to not look at them as just beautiful words. There's really, you know, just a, I mean, Paul is really trying to communicate something to a church that's not really operating and performing very well. Um, and, I, you know, even outside of what we've talked about related to spiritual gifts and how you have some people who are boastful and arrogant about what they have, and then you have other people who are, who are envious of other people because of a gift that they have and that they don't have, um, realize that the Corinthian church had other problems even outside of that, that circle of an issue. Um, you know, right at the very beginning, we, we, you know, Paul talks about how he's been made aware that there's divisions among the church, in the, within the church. And there are some people saying, I follow Paul, uh, Paul, uh, Paul. and so there's, uh, bleh, bleh. <laughs> there's one for the blah, blah. There's one for the blooper reel, right? Others saying, I follow Apollos and, and so forth and so on. And so right from the very beginning, we see that, that, um, that the Corinthians were, uh, you know, they had a lot of things that were kind of out of line and out of, and out of whack. And so when you come up to this area here, um, and especially given what we've seen in the immediate context in the previous, uh, previous chapter of chapter 12, uh, we just see how deeply rooted that sort of thing really is. And so... Where we are right now, and we've, we've uh, in the past couple of months have been talking about, um, you know, the whole thing of love and the importance of love. Uh, remember that Paul, right at the uh, right at the end of of chapter twelve, where he, see, he uses this phrase at the at the very end of chapter twelve, he says, "And I will show you still a still more excellent way, more excellent than what the Corinthians were doing, given you know what their hard attitudes were towards one another." And so we started to dive in a little bit into, into talking about how Paul describes love and what it is. And so um, I don't think I want to spend a great deal of time reviewing what we talked about last time. Um, one reason is because it's not necess we're not necessarily dealing with you know, things that build on one another necessarily. Um, but number two, there's a lot I feel like I need to say about about what remains in the passage that we're looking at here. Um, one of the challenges that I've, that I've had just in preparing for this week, and hopefully there isn't any sort of, uh, this doesn't turn out in the way that I don't want it to, but the, we're gonna be looking at a couple of passages, two or three passages outside of 1 Corinthians 13. And the, the challenge is, is to, like with each of those texts, to not preach a whole sermon on each of those texts within the whole within the when the, within this entire sermon, so a sermon within a sermon within a sermon is what I what I want to avoid. But there's so much to be said and so much that I hope that we grasp as we look at this whole thing of love. Now, what I will do, I will read uh, verses uh, four through seven again. Um, well, no, actually, let me go. I'll go back. I'll start at the beginning of the of the chapter just so we can get a full you know, uh, verses one through, through seven. We're going to be looking at verses six through seven, but again, let me just start at verse one so again, we can kind of have a, a, a bigger picture of what we're dealing with here. So again, remember at the end of, of chapter 12, Paul is saying, and I will show you st a, a still more excellent way. Then he goes into chapter 13, where he says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I and if I if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. 
If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. And here's where we Here's where we're getting into our text this morning, starting in verse 6. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So again, like I said, I mean, those are, those are beautiful words phrased in a very beautiful way. At least I think so, and I think a lot of other people uh, think so as well. Um, hopefully... Last month when we were looking at verses 4 and 5, you kind of, as we, as we talk through those things about what it means for love to be patient and kind and, you know, not being arrogant and, and envious and, and that sort of thing, hopefully you, uh, we kind of get, had, you know, kind of grasp the understanding of, of you know, what, it lo- what those things look like, what it looks like when, we're, when we go against these particular descriptions and prescriptions as it relates to love. But let's just go ahead and jump in right here and just continue where we left off in verse, um, in verse 6, um, where it says, it, where it, says it, um, it, that is love, does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Okay. Now, what does this whole thing mean where he says that it, do, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing? Um, I think mainly what you're dealing with there. With, the, with rejoicing in wrongdoing has to do with how we look at somebody else's wrongdoing within the community. Uh, so, and in looking at somebody else's wrongdoing, the whole idea of rejoicing at wrongdoing, which in, on its face sounds very unusual and sounds kind of, uh, that in itself sounds, sounds pretty wicked. But um, in the context of what it means within the, within the community of believers, I think what you're dealing with mostly um, is an attitude of somebody who rejoices at somebody else's wrongdoing, not because they approve of the wrongdoing, um, but they see it as a way of seeing that person as kind of less, just as far as morality is concerned, just as far as, you know, you know that person, you know, you know, I would never do something like that. Whereas, you know, that person might, might, uh, might do that sort of thing, but I, I would never do that sort of thing. Man, that guy ought to be ashamed of himself, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's kind of one of those things where you might look at somebody else's wrongdoing and rejoice in it in the sense that it makes you feel better about yourself. I don't know if any of you have, uh, have encountered people um, who have uh, made mention of you know, whatever comes across the screen, uh, on, on the screen on the Jerry Springer show, um, which, is that show still on? Does anybody know? I don't know. I don't really care one way or the other. I was just curious. But, I mean, we, we remember the Jerry Springer show. Whether it's on TV still or not, I think many of us are aware of the, of the circus show that's, that's, uh, that's on there. And, uh, you know, it's funny because I've heard some people say, I like watching the Jerry Springer show because it makes me feel better about myself, you know, and that's very easy when you see what goes on on those shows and what people bring forth on the stage. Um, you know, some people might say it's, it's, you know, it's scripted and in some sense, maybe that's correct. Maybe that's true. But um, whether it's real or whether it's not real, I know that some people, you know, have been able to say, man, when we see the wickedness and the and the trashy behavior of people on that show, it makes me feel a whole lot better. And so there you see somebody who you know, is able to play the comparison game and is able to kind of look at themselves as a, uh, in, a, in a more easier light. But I think there's a couple of things that we need to realize as it relates to that. Now, I just use Jerry Springer as an example. It's just an example. Let's set that aside now, now that we've gotten that example out of the way. Within, within the community of believers, you know, if we're talking about somebody, let's say, who is struggling with a sin, who is caught up in a sin, um, we have to understand a couple of things before we might automatically loft ourselves up on a higher plane than somebody who's in that position. And that is, is that, one, number one, is that while they might have fallen into a certain sin or are, is, is enslaved in, in, you know, in whatever, 
it may be true, maybe, that you wouldn't fall in the same sin. I don't think we should have confidence and, and puff ourselves up and say that we would never do that, and I'll show you why here in a second. But for the sake of argument, let's say that it may be true that you might not do the same thing as person A or person B did, but I think a lot of us would agree that when it comes to ourselves, we have our own areas of sin that we struggle with. That maybe other, the other people aren't prone to doing. So, okay, you may not do that sin there. Or that might be, not be a sin that comes easiest to you. Uh, but what about your own struggles in certain areas of sin? I think I've mentioned in times past um, that uh, all of us sin in many different ways. But for a lot of us, there's, there's maybe one or two sins that are kind of serve as our specialty. We specialize in this sin or that sin. Man, this is something that's, that, that's really been a battle in my life. I mean, whatever that might be. You might know in your own lives what that, what that is and what that looks like. Um, but all of this is to say is that, okay, you might not do the same thing that somebody else does, but you have your own areas of struggle as well. And somebody can just as easily look at you and say, what is, the, what is up with that guy? I would never do what he does. You know, so we're, so we're in the same situation as somebody else. It's just we're just dealing with different sin. Now, hopefully, you know, with the movement of the Spirit in our lives and then the work of sanctification, we, you know, we day by day, you know, kind of look more and more like Jesus Christ um, as we're shaped more into his image. And that leads into the second point is that we're all a work in progress. Um, you know, we all haven't reached perfection yet. That doesn't happen until Jesus Christ comes back. And Jesus Christ does his own work in his own way in each individual lives. Um, so having those two thoughts in our minds, um, I think, is very helpful to kind of give us a little bit of perspective on this. Now, I want to turn your attention to um, Galatians chapter 6. So if you want to turn there real quickly. Actually, actually, let's do this. Still turn to Galatians 6, but also keep your finger in there and go to, and go to 3 John for a second. Because what we're seeing here in, in, in this verse here in, 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 chapter, in 1 Corinthians 13, you notice it says um, there's something attached to, uh, attached to the whole thing of not rejoicing in wrongdoing. Remember it says um, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Now what does that mean? I think, I think John gives us a good example in in 3 John, the little itty bitty book of 3 John just has one chapter. So in verse 3, um, notice what it says there. Um, it says, For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So I think that in a very real way, that's what it, that's what it looks like when it's talking about you know, rejoicing, rejoicing in the truth. Um, it's not necessarily talking about theological or doctrinal truth, although obviously we can rejoice in, in that. Um, that is a thing, but contextually, the whole thing of rejoicing in the truth what Paul is, is, is communicating here, and I think John helps us out here in 3 John, um, is the whole thing of rejoicing in seeing somebody walking in the truth. Now, if, we're, if we encounter somebody who's caught in wrongdoing or they're struggling with sin, you know, obviously we don't rejoice in that and we don't, as I've mentioned before, kind of look down on them. But again, if we're wanting to look at this whole thing of love and action, I think, I think uh, Paul in Galatians chapter 6 kind of gives us an idea. So we see somebody who's not, you know, walking in truth or they're caught up in sin. Obviously, we don't rejoice in that. So what do we do instead? I think the whole idea here is to help somebody along so that they go into the, get into the path where they are walking in the truth. And when we see them walking in the truth, coming out of whatever it is that they're struggling with, they rejoice. And don't you see there is the working of the body of Christ helping one another out. So in Galatians chapter 6, let's look at the first few verses here, um, where it says, um, 
Actually, we can just look at the, at the first two. Uh, where he says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, just in those two verses, there's a lot that can be said. And again, the challenge that I have this morning is not preaching a sermon on Galatians 6 within the, within the sermon of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13. Because that, to me, just those two verses, there's a whole sermon in there. But let's just hit on some of the highlights here and what Paul is talking about in dealing with, as it says here, if anyone is caught in any transgression, whatever that transgression might be, I mean, it could be multiple things, you know, that somebody might be, might be caught in. What we're not to do is look, at, look, and look on them and rejoice in their wrongdoing so that we feel better about ourselves. But as it says there, it says, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Okay, now it's interesting. He says, you who are spiritual. Now, what does that mean exactly? I think quite simply what Paul is saying is that some, you, if you are one who is walking in the Spirit, being guided by the Spirit, living your life anchored in the Word of God and being guided by Him, you are in a position to go and help that person who is in that transgression. I think that's basically what, you mean, what we mean by somebody who is, who is spiritual. So you who are spiritual, who are in that position, should restore. And the whole word of restore in the original has this idea of, you know, mending something that's broken. It's usually, it was usually used to describe uh, fishermen who mended their nets. And so there we're talking about a restoring back to, back to a previous condition, I guess maybe is the best way to put it there. So he says the spiritual person is the one who should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Now, isn't it tempting sometimes when you see somebody who's caught in a sin to just really, you feel this need, maybe out of frustration or, or whatever the case may be, to just lay it on them and say, bro, sis, what in the world do you think you're doing? Blah, 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 blah. And you just kind of lay the hammer down on them. Paul here says it, there's, there's a certain attitude that goes about this. It's you do it with a spirit of gentleness. And I think that what the sentence that he says right after that gives us a clue as to why we approach with a spirit of gentleness. Because he says, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. And that goes back to the whole thing of, you know, what we we're talking about before. Again, um, I think it's important for us to understand that if we're dealing with somebody who's caught in a particular transgression or sin. Um, we need to be aware of the fact that we are not necessarily immune to falling into that same trap in that same sin. And so we might come across as people who are, um, you know, think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And, and actually, if you go further in there, um, in, uh, in, in verse 3, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. I mean, you know, we can be people who really puff ourselves up and say, that's something that would never characterize me. And as we're puffing ourselves up, we suddenly fall into the same pit. We have to be careful of that. We're understanding our own, our, our own tendency to stumble, our own vulnerabilities, we understand. And if, and if we are those people who are spiritual, we approach with a spirit of gentleness and saying, Brother, sister, let me help you out. And so that's what, he goes into, uh, that's what he goes into when he's talking about bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. You think about a burden, you usually, usually don't think of something positive. Um, I've never, you know, you, you hardly think of a positive burden. You know, burden sounds exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's heavy. You know, it, it's, it's something that, you know, can potentially break the back, you know. Um, and so the whole idea of coming up alongside somebody and bearing their burdens, I mean, really, if you really think about it, 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 it it's, a, it's a true demonstration of love where instead of standing at a distance, because that that's what we can do, right? 
and in a certain way mocking somebody and saying, how could you do this, so, you know, so forth and so on, coming up alongside of them, lifting up that burden and carrying it with them. And that can, that can take many different forms, whether we're talking about through prayer, whether through instruction of the word, you know, whatever the case may be and whatever the spirit might lead you to do in helping that person out, if you're in that, if you're in that spiritual position, that is, that is what it means to come along and bear one another's burdens, right? I think Paul, you know, if you, if you were to flip back to chapter four, I want you to, I want you to pay attention to, to Paul's words here um, that he mentions here to the Galatians. And remember, if you remember the, 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 uh, the uh, situation with the Galatian churches, um, the Galatian churches were under the influence of the Judaizers who were saying that, um, that salvation is not Christ alone. It's Christ plus something else. And in this case, it's works or, cir- or, or circumcision. And because the Galatian churches were really starting to you know, kind of buy into this sort of thing, it really distressed Paul. One of the things you notice about about Paul's letter to the Galatians is that it really doesn't start out the way that he does a lot of his other epistles. You know, usually with with his other epistles, he says, I thank God for you, and, you know, I see how God is working in your life, doing this and that, so forth and so on. With Galatians, with the Galatians, he gets right to the point. He says, I am surprised that you're so quickly, you know, embracing this whole thing that these Judaizers are saying. I mean, he didn't use those exact words, but I mean, that's the, that's the essence of what he was saying. But Paul's approach to the Galatians wasn't, um, wasn't a matter of, you know, him taking his, his heel and stomping on them um, because of, you know, what they were doing and what they were believing. Um, what's illustrated here in Galatians 4, and I'm looking at verses 18 and 19, with an emphasis on verse 19. But I think what you have the idea here is that Paul having a, a desire and a concern for the Galatians' spiritual upbringing, their, their spiritual well-being, um, their, um, their formation into Christ-likeness. Um, and so if you read in, verses, in chapter 4, verse 18, it says, it is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not when I am pre- and, and not only when I am present with you. Now, verse nineteen, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you. Wow, I mean, like until I am a, a, who I am again in the anguish of childbirth. I mean, that's that's very strong language. Now, I'm not a woman, okay, um, and I've obviously that means I've never been pregnant. Um, and, well, society teaches that if I say I am, I could, but that's another issue. But, you know, you know I'm not a man. We'll never know what it is to be, pre- uh, be pregnant. We'll never know what it is to give birth. Um, but I've heard from more than one woman that, um, that it is a painful, painful, painful process. Um, and so, you know, you, you kind of have this thing where Paul deliberately using the, using the whole language of childbirth to describe, you know, you know, his inner feeling as he wishes to see, as it says there, um, until Christ is formed in you. This whole thing of, of I think that's the way of, of, desi- of, if, of him expressing his desire so much to see Christ formed in them so that they look more and more like Christ and think along the same wavelengths as Christ, as is revealed in his truth. Okay, notice, again, notice it says that, um, for who I am again in anguish in childbirth. I think initially the whole idea of, of childbirth was his, was his initial contact with the Galatians and wanting them desperately to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And many of them did. Now he really wants them to, to wants to see Christ formed in them, that process of, think, of sanctification. And the fact that he uses that, he expresses that desire in such language is, is very telling of the Apostle Paul and his, and his attitude and his desire, you know, for their, for their well-being. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an attitude and it's language of love there, okay? And so when you go back to, to, uh, to chapter 6, uh, where he says... Um, you know, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. 
Now, what are we talking about with the law of Christ? I think the law of Christ is, is simply stated in what Jesus himself said to his disciples. He said it to them, and by extension, it's, it's a command to us, where he says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And that's going back to what I said a few minutes ago, where we're talking about getting, a, a getting up alongside somebody and bearing their load, being an expression of love. That's what that is. And in doing that, as it says there, so that we fulfill the law of Christ. Love in action. That's what, that's, that's what, that's what love looks like. And I think that back in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, when it's talking about um, you know, not rejoicing in wrongdoing, but um, rejoicing with the truth, I think hopefully you have a little bit more of an understanding um, of, of what's being communicated there. Okay, so that's the first mini-sermon within this whole sermon here. Uh, <laughs> now, f- back in 1 Corinthians 13, you see in verse 7 where he says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So let's start with that first, that first line there, that first phrase there in verse 7, where he says, love bears all things. The, uh, the meaning uh, in the original language has this idea of, um, of covering. You know, you, you, you cover over uh, somebody's uh, faults or their failings or their stumblings. Um, depending on what translation you're using, uh, you know, it might say love always protects, right? Um, it protects somebody who, as we've talked about before, maybe is caught in that transgression, Um, Now, let me just mention something else here, because for some people that might sound like, that might sound a little bit scandalous. You know, you maybe kind of get the get the idea of somebody who's caught into very deep sin. And so, you know, you know, nobody needs to know about it at all and just kind of just keep it hush hush. You know, nobody needs to know. Just kind of tuck it to the side, especially if we're dealing with leaders in the church. Let's not say anything about it. You know, it'll work itself out, whatever the case, you know, but love protects. We have to protect them so, you know, we don't do anything at all. That's not the idea here of saying that love always bears or covers or protects all things. There, you know, if we look at other portions of Scripture, we know that there is a time when those things need to be revealed. But it's not the first go-to that you, that, you need, that you need to do as it relates to somebody else's sin or somebody else's failings or somebody's struggle with a particular sin. You know, you could be aware of somebody's, of somebody's struggle and maybe the first thing you do is just kind of whisper it to somebody else. Hey, can you believe, you know, John is, you know, he's doing this, he's doing A, B, C, or have you heard this, blah, 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 blah. And we, and we sort of publicize it and uh, for no apparent reason. And, uh, and if we do try and pin a reason to it, we try to kind of cloak it with a, with, a, with a spiritual appearance. And we say, let's, you know, we need to keep so-and-so in our prayers because he is doing this, 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 and this. Which he might need our prayers. I mean, that's, praying for a person who's in sin isn't a bad thing. But it, 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 it would be very telling if we are ones who, who go to other people and we gather around the people around us and we say, hey, so-and-so is doing this and he did this and this, let's pray for him. And then you, never, and then you yourself never pray for him. I mean, if that's the case, then that's very telling as well. Basically, what we do in those, those, in those situations is making gossip look good. Basically, that's what that is. Um, and so if you were to look at Matthew 18... Here's mini sermon number two. Um, a passage of scripture that we're that I think many of us are very aware of. If you look at verse 15, um, and it says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So we're not talking about necessarily, okay love protects or love covers all things in the sense of we just pretend that it's not a thing and that nothing needs to be addressed. But again, we're just saying it's not something that you need to publicize and just kind of air out somebody else's dirty laundry. 
you know, to everybody else, especially if you haven't talked to that person yourself. So there is something that needs to be addressed. The only thing is it starts out between you and that other person. Notice that it's saying you. We're not necessarily saying this person is in sin, go to the pastor or, you know, whatever, and then just have him take care of it. This is kind of, you can kind of see some of the parallels between this and the, and the whole thing of you who are spiritual that we just looked at in, in Galatians 6. But the whole thing is you keep, it, you keep it in house between you and that other person. Now notice what it says here after that, still in verse 15. It says, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. See, that's the goal. Okay, that's the goal. You, you, and again, the, the idea here is kind of along the same wavelength of, of wanting to restore that person. That's, that's, what you're, that's what you're really aiming for. And again, I hope that you see that with, with something like you see here in, in Matthew 18 and even with what we saw in Galatians chapter 6, do you get the sense that if we're, if we're wanting to talk about true unity in the body of Christ and love in action within the body of Christ, that part of what makes up that makeup is a concern for other people's spiritual well-being. I hope you're picking up on that. I think that that's something within the church at large today in our culture um, is something that really gets put by the wayside. Um, a lot of the times when it comes to our concern for other people in the church, it has to do with things, you know, in the, within the physical um, and that's, and that's, we don't dismiss that either by any means. Okay. So don't misunderstand me in saying that that's not an important thing, but I think for a lot of time, a lot of times it's easy for us to focus on that at the expense of somebody's spiritual well-being. You know, do we, I mean, going back to, going back to, to Paul's words about being in the anguish of childbirth, is that, is that a description that can, that can, describe us as it relates to other people and our relationships with other Christians within the body of Christ. Now listen, I have to ask myself that question too. So I'm not, so understand, I'm not, I'm not, again, this isn't me laying the hammer down on, on you and saying that and putting myself on a perch. Um, that would be being actively going against what I'm teaching right now, actually. So, but understand, but you know, do you understand what I'm saying? That, you know, there's, there's something to be said about fellowship and unity within the body of Christ that makes a big deal of wanting other people to be spiritually well. And when we don't see people who are spiritually well, it, it, it twists us up. We aren't pushed to that whole thing of, ah, oh, look at that person, I'm much better than him. We might not say those words, but really the, the spirit within us can kind of, can kind of turn that, that thought in our heads are we concerned and, do we, and are we grieved, you know, at, at such displays? I mean, going back to, I mean, even what we consider with, with the Corinthians, remember when, when Paul told them about the, the man who was, the, the sexual immorality that was going on within the, within the congregation, um, you know, where a man uh, had his father's wife, where he was sleeping with his stepmother. And Paul was saying, that's something that you don't even see in the pagan world. And, he's, and essentially he's saying that sort of thing is going on and you're not grieved. Instead, you're arrogant. And what I think he was drawing back from is drawing back to the whole things that he mentioned before where people are puff puffing themselves up because they're saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, and that sort of thing. He says, your mindset is not in the right place. There's not even any sort of grieving there. And so... You know, just laying out that challenge here, just based on what we've seen here, I hope that I hope you get the I hope you get an understanding that, you know, really having a concern for the spiritual well-being of others is a must. You know, if we really want to experience that love, experience that unity, and then when we see somebody who is kind of drifting on the wayside, that captures us, that that grips us. It ties us in knots and we come, we come alongside somebody and we bear their burdens and we don't broadcast it. We don't publicize it. We come up before them just between the two of them and it, between you and the other person with the hope of bringing restoration. That's the goal. Now, we don't have to look at the rest of that passage. Again, the goal is not to preach a long sermon on each of these passages, but if you go further into that passage, you see that 
if the person remains unrepentant down the steps that you go, you know, there may come a point where it is you know, brought out into the open. But even with that, even with that, if we understand that passage correctly, we understand that what the goal is not, even when it, it comes to the whole thing of bringing it to the church, is not so that you can actively humiliate them and say, hey, everybody, hey, church, you know what, what so-and-so is doing here and what his, what his sin is? He refuses to repent, you know, and everybody just kind of, you know, you know fixes their eye on them and saying, man, what a, what a worthless nobody. The idea of bringing it to the church is so that the whole church then can approach them out of love and saying, hey, you need to come back, repent, you know, that sort of thing. That's, that's, what, the, that's what the goal of that is. So even at that stage, you see love in action, okay? So, back to uh, 1 Corinthians 13. So, love bears all things, verse 7, and believes all things as well. And the idea that we have here of believes all things um, is, uh, is, is kind of along, uh, along the lines of not always having a a spirit of, of suspicion uh, towards people. You know, sometimes when you're, when you're it, you know, this might be the case even when you're meeting somebody for the first time and you want to size them up and saying, you know, what's the, what kind of person is this? Does he kind of believe the same things as I do? Is he doing, you know, that sort of thing. And we're suspicious towards people. Instead of giving people the benefit of the doubt. Now, um, I think that this can also tie into the whole thing of what we might tend to do in certain situations where we, where we automatically assign impure motives to people when really there's no evidence to suggest that they have impure motives about certain things. Um, there was a, there's calls to mind a time when I was, when I was working at the, uh, working at the mission uh, years back and uh, there was a particular guy I was interacting with and you know, I'd gotten to know, kind of built some sort of relationship with him. He wasn't a believer, but um, there was one time where I was, uh, I was eating lunch with him. It was lunchtime, and I, I sat down at his table, and it was, you know, we had a conversation and everything. And uh, we, when we were both finished, we both got up, and we went to the window there to drop off our tray and our plate and everything. And on the way there, there was another staff member who was sitting at, a, who was sitting at another table, and he saw me passing by, and he kind of gave me a wave. And, you know, and while, the, while this was happening, the, the guy that I was had been eating lunch with was talking to me. He was saying something to me. And uh, I was passing by this table where this other staff member was sitting and uh, the staff member kind of waved to me and he said, hey dad. And I said, hey son, it's an inside joke, don't worry about it. But you know, he said, hey dad. <laughs> he said, hey dad, I said, what's up son? And, uh, and then, you know, just two seconds at the most, you know, along with the customary chuckle. Um, but uh, the guy that I was with really didn't take well to that. He didn't take well to him being interrupted. And what he said next, you know, just, well, it didn't surprise, it kind of surprised me, but it didn't. You'd have to know him and have interactions like, you know, this is something like this was, was kind of his tendency where, you know, he said, he said, you know what, why would he do something like that and interrupt? And he said, he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't do that if I weren't homeless. And I don't think I said anything at the time. I, I think I said, I said, look, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. I think that's the extent of, of what it was. But it really kind of, in a certain way, just kind of grieved me inwardly because other than, other than Pastor Tom Barber, who, who runs the place, I can't think of anyone else who is a bigger advocate for the homeless than that guy who, who waved at me. I mean, we're talking about somebody who, you know, says, I'm, I, you know, I've been writing this. I'm, ho I'm thinking of reaching out to our legislators here, uh, you know, but regarding this and this, you know, having to do with the homeless and everything. I mean, he, I mean, I've, in just in conversations with him, he says, I want to do this. I want to do this, you know, help the homeless here and that sort of thing. I, again, other than Pastor Tom, I can't think of anybody else who, who advocates so strongly for the homeless. But yet this person I was talking to automatically assigned a motive or impure attitudes of saying he wouldn't do that to me if, if I weren't homeless. He was incorrect. And so that's the whole thing. I mean, giving people the benefit of the doubt and, and also not assigning, you know, 
certain motives to, to people. I mentioned before the whole thing of, of suspicion and not always having an eye of suspicion on people, but giving people the benefit of the doubt. Um, I want to call your attention to Revelation chapter 2. Um, and here, I think this is a good um, biblical example of this, and especially as, it, as it's tied into the whole thing of, um, of love. Uh, but um, in chapter 2, um, you have this whole thing of um, the start of, of these letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And the first one that, that's there in chapter 2 is, is, the, is the letter to the church in Ephesus. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that we know about a church in Ephesus um, is, the, is the whole thing where it talks about that you've lost your first love. Or as some translation says, or as mine says here, the love you had to have at first. Um, there it says in, in verse 4, but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Now, the way that a lot of people approach that, that verse, a lot of people interpret that to mean that when he's saying that you've lost, you've lost your first love or you don't have the love that you had at, had at first, you know, a lot of emphasis is put on, okay, their love for God, their fire for God, their, their, their passion for the Lord Jesus Christ has, has, has grown very dim, and so they need to restore that. Um, and that's how most people look at that. I would, I would challenge that, uh, that perspective. Um, one big reason uh, being what he says at, um, in describing the good things about that church in verse 2, where he says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. And that's, I think that's the operative phrase there. So the fact that they're, that they're passionate about truth and wanting to discriminate between truth and error and being careful not to have error come in and bearing up on, under all these things for Christ's name, for the name of Christ and for his glory, doesn't seem to match, at least from what I see here, a church where it's saying, okay, now your love is starting to die off for the Lord. It doesn't seem to go together. I think what the, the, the central message here as it relates to them losing their first love, or as it says in verse 4, the love that they had at first is the love that they had for one another. And if you understand the setup there of them testing, you know, all these people and even having to deal with the people who claim to be apostles and are not, and even, before, even afterwards where he's talking about their, their contention with the Nicolaitans, which was another um, false sect, you kind of get the idea of how love for other people and having a continual suspicion for other people can really start to creep in because having to deal with all of that now when you have when you look at other people you look at them kind of with suspicion and they say okay what do you believe are you on the same wavelength as me and and that sort of internal spirit and the way that we approach the people inwardly might have a very strong effect of how we deal with them outwardly and so while at one point they were passionate with for other people and had a love for other people now they're dealing with, they're dealing with, you're dealing with a church that's gripped with suspicion and the light of love that they have for their other brothers and sisters is kind of growing dim because of that suspicion that's there. When it comes to 1 Corinthians 13, the whole thing is, is that love believes all things. It gives people the benefit of the doubt. Now, you know, things might unfold later on where we think, okay, Maybe this person isn't the, you know, the type of person that we thought they were. They didn't believe the thing. They're believing dangerous things. But even then, you, they, you have that perfect opportunity to bear one another's burdens and come alongside them and that sort of thing to kind of maintain that unity and to foster that relationship with those other people that may not be where they need to be um, as it relates to their growth in Christ. So, love bears all things, believes all things, Thirdly, in verse 7, it hopes all things. And I think very simply, you know, this, you know, what we're dealing with there is that you're wishing for, you have a wish for other people's well-being. Um, I mentioned before 3 John, um, and we looked at verses 3 and 4. If you were to look, and you don't have to turn there, but if you were to look at the verse even previous to that, you see um, John saying there, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you 
and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. There's kind of the, the dual thing that I said that I'd mentioned there before. So we can have a, a, a love and concern as it relates to people's health um, and well-being in life, but it's, it's not detached from you know, having a desire that other people spiritually are doing, are doing, uh, are doing well. And there's that hope that, you know, of, of good health and also, you know, a good spiritual condition in other people. It hopes all things um, in, that, in that sense. And then finally in verse 7, it says uh, that love endures all things. Um, and I would say that basically what you're, what you're dealing with there is that, you know, love, love doesn't die. Even in the midst of the heaviest um, problems, persecutions, um, and that sort of thing, it's very interesting. You know, it's just encountering that that whole that phrase that love endures all things. You know what I thought of? I thought of the Energizer Bunny. Um, you guys remember those commercials, right? Where you know you there would be like kind of this mock commercial, and then. And then here comes the Energizer Bunny and the, and the narrator goes, still going, nothing outlasts the Energizer Bunny. You know, he just keeps going and going and going. And I thought, what a cool way to, it, would that be to kind of look at love in that way? It keeps going and going and going and going in any situation. And again, I, I, you know, when it comes to the whole topic of love, it's, it's easy to think of love as, uh, as something that's natural or something that keeps going and going if we're surrounded by agreeable people who remain agreeable 24-7. But that's not how life works. And the emphasis here, as we, as we talked about last time and I think even the time before, is that this whole discussion that Paul has of, uh, of love really has the idea of what love looks like even as it relates to unagreeable people um, and you know, how love is extended even in that. And I can't think of any other greater example of what this looks like than our Lord Jesus Christ himself. I mean, we're all familiar with John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God gave up his own son for a world that, let's be honest, they didn't love him first. And that's what scripture says, right? And even if you're, if you're, if you're considering the time of the crucifixion, the time of the cross, everything leading up to that point, being beaten, whipped, um, you know, uh, just reviled, spit upon, having to carry his own cross for a certain length of time before, you know, Simon and Cyrene came in and, and picked up that load. You know, uh, I would think, man, if, if, if the idea was to, was to die for the world and their in that immediate location, the world is, is hating you and spitting on you and, and, and whatnot, to say, man, forget this. I'll, we can't do whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. His love endured all the way through the cross. Everything, I mean, in that whole time of it, of it going forward, Jesus' thought and his attitude was never, it's not worth it, Right? Now, let that settle in your mind for a few seconds and let that, let the, you know, just let that settle and think about that because that's really, that's really huge. And so Christ being our greatest example, you know, we, uh, and again, you just think about the, some of the tendencies that we might have towards other people and how even some of the littlest things can cause us to want to write people off. I try, not to, I try not to make light of, of some people, like, you know, if, if something has rubbed them the wrong way or something. But, you know, sometimes if somebody has, somebody's been offended by something else that somebody else said and they say, well, they said this, sometimes I'm like, you need to grow up. And, and because of that, you're going to write them off. That, now, I don't say that to them. <laughs> I, don't, I, I usually don't say it in that way. Okay, love, 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 love. But, <laughs> you know... But I mean, there's, there's a certain aspect of that where it's like, that is just peanuts. peanuts. You need to get over yourself. And so it's, it's, this, it's this whole thing of, you know, and, and again, it's, a, it's not, it's, it, and let me just say this, and I, I just mentioned a few seconds ago, it's not really simply just only a matter of this little small thing sets you off. 
that it sets you off and you're ready to write off that other person. You see this a lot in churches sometimes. Oh, this person didn't do this for me, so I'm just going to go to another church. Listen, I wish, I wish you all the best as you go to that other church, but, I mean, there might need to be some self-inventory that needs to go on there. If that one little thing makes you pack, pack up your bags and leave to another place. You know what I'm saying? And so the whole thing of love endures, even, even in some of the most harshest of situations. Now listen, that's not something that we do on our own, on our own strength and our own power. And again, this is something that as the Holy Spirit is working in us, Hopefully he transforms us to give us a better uh, a, a perspective on things and how to deal with those disagreeable people in those disagreeable situations. And listen, I would, I would appeal to all of you that you, that you, would, that you would bear with me. I mean, I, I try to be an agreeable person as much as I can with all of you. Um, I'm not going to promise that I will be all the time, and it's not that I mean to or anything like that, but, um, you know, I, I, you know, I hope that, uh, <laughs> uh, do you get what I'm saying, right? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, and I say that with, with the, I say all this with the thought that, you know, I can, you know, because I'm not perfect. Um, it, <laughs> you are very quick to, to agree on that, on that I'm statement not, there. I'm okay. not perfect. <laughs> Big no, I get it though, and, and you're and you're right to quickly disagree uh, to quickly agree with that statement because I am, you know, and uh, you know I've you know and even in, in in times past, not maybe with you necessarily, um, but with with other people where you know I've had to learn a lesson on on how I interact with people, um, you know, and uh, you know it's it's one of those things you have to be very careful and just kind of think, man. Do I harbor that same attitude where my love starts to grow dim because he said a word or he said a phrase? And a lot of times, you know, that, they might not even mean anything by what they said. But then if, 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 uh, if, we, if we're with the, in the mode that, um, that says that, uh, you know, that we're suspicious um, or that we, you know, we don't believe all things, that's a perfect setup where, you know, because of a word that somebody might say, we don't give them the benefit of the doubt and say, and we automatically think he meant ill will towards me when he said that. Well, that might not be true. And if I'm not thinking with the, with the right proper perspective and my love doesn't endure, you know, and I say, well, okay, well, forget that person. I'm just going to stay clear with them. I, you know, might go to another church. And I don't, at the very least, try and seek out some sort of understanding. Where I say, I noticed that before you said this and that, what exactly did you mean by that? Because, you know, I, I kind of took it this way, but I'd like to think that that's not what you meant. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit more? And, and at the very least, try and get, gain some understanding. But opposite of that, I don't think that we can really um, hope, to, hope to grow as we should in unity without this in mind. Does that make sense? And so hopefully, you know, this kind of, you know, anchors our hearts and minds for, for what Paul will go on to say. Now, this whole thing of what he says about, about love enduring, uh, love endures all things is the perfect setup for what he says um, in verses 8 through 8 through 13, which we're going to look at, look at next month. But even there, I think you can see in the, in the, in the first phrase there, verse 8, at least how it's worded in my translation, that love never ends. Um, now, that's connected to what we just talked about before, but there's certain other aspects to that whole thing of love never ends um, that's important for us to understand as well in addition to that. And so we'll get into, the, that, into that next time. So for now, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for what you reveal in your word, I pray that this, that what you've spoken to us this morning um, would be deeply anchored. We know, Lord, that our, our tendency to wander away from what's revealed to us, Lord, and I pray that, um, that your uh, spirit would, would lead us back um, to the right motives, the right perspectives, the, the right actions as it relates to love, Lord. And I just thank you, Lord, that 
uh, even in times when we fail in these areas, that you are patient with us. You're the embodiment of love that's expressed in that chapter. You are patient and kind, even when, even when we're not, and even we, when we don't live according to the prescriptions that's laid out in Scripture. We thank you so much, Lord, for your patience with us. And it's because of your love for us that you continue along with us because your, greatest, your great desire in our lives is for, is for us to look more and more like your son. And so for each and every one of us, Lord, I pray that that would be, again, as I say, something that's anchored in our hearts and our minds. Let this be something, as I mentioned at the beginning, not be something that's just a matter of just words and beautiful words where we, can, where we just say, isn't that nice? But I hope that, I pray, Lord, that as we, even beyond this time, meditate on your on your truths that have been laid out this morning um i just i just pray that uh, that you would continue to speak to us and that we would grasp all the more the great import of your words and uh, may those be used um, all the more uh, for our transformation lord i thank you again for this time and thank you again for your word um, and i pray this in jesus name amen